Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the Oregon seminar this week. This week we have a talk uh, by uh, Dr. Gate Turner, who uh, received his bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy, astronomy from here at the University of Arizona. Afterward, which he uh, went on to the University of Virginia to complete his PhD there in 2018. And after that, he moved on to Cornell, where he started as a postdoc. And then in 2021, he got the uh, Hubble Fellowship and he stayed at Cornell because I guess you really like it there. <laughs> oh, it's, it's really nice. <laughs> yeah. So and today he's going to talk about us, uh, talk to us about uh, radio detections of exoplanets. So exciting. So go ahead. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming in person as well as on Zoom. Uh, and as Yancy and Serena just mentioned to me, I talked to them about this project when I was an undergrad in like 2007, 2008. So that's a long time ago. And uh, now I figured out how to do it. So I'm going to jump right in. Oh, now it's not working anymore. Ah. Okay. So I first like to start with the acknowledgments of some of my main collaborators on this project. Uh, so I work with Philip Zarka uh, and John, John Mateus Gressemeyer. Uh, both are in France. Uh, I've been working with them for almost seven years now on this project, as well as the NINIFAR and LOFAR uh, radio telescope exoplanet teams. So there's a lot of engineers as well as scientists that have helped a lot, as well as everybody who's funded me for the past 10 years or more in this research. So I just like to start with like the super brief overview of the exoplanet research, because I know a lot of people do exoplanets here, but maybe some people don't. Uh, so there are currently 5,000 exoplanets known. There's new ones discovered every day, uh, new either just typical ones or exotic ones. We're really good at studying their fundamental properties, their radius, their mass, orbital distance, temperature. So basically fundamental properties of the planets themselves, uh, as well as orbital variations due to just them, their orbits decaying or other planets in the system uh, to changing their orbits. Uh, as well as we're getting really good at starting to characterize their atmospheres. A lot of people in this room work on that. Uh, both with JHST in the past 10 years, as well as now the revolution with uh, JWST, which is just going to explode uh, like crazy in terms of studying elements, molecules, escaping atmospheres, weather, clouds, um, all these 3D effects and stuff like that. But the question that a lot of people always ask at Colloquium, what about their magnetic fields? Uh, and this is something I've been thinking about since 2007 when I was an undergrad in the University of Arizona. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, so what about them? So if you take a step back and you look at basically the substellar population, so both in the solar system and outside the solar system, magnetic field seems quite ubiquitous. So in the solar system, all the planets have or are had a magnetic field sometime in their uh, their history. Venus is still a question mark, but some people think it may actually have a magnetic field. We just have to go figure out how to detect it, uh, as well as Ganymede and the moon. Uh, so Ganymede currently has a magnetic field, and the moon used to have a magnetic field. So it seems like magnetic fields are very, very ubiquitous for planets. Uh, and I show some of the structure of magnetic structures here for the solar system planets, and the diversity is quite complex, like the rotation axis, the magnetic axis, and you know Neptune is just really wonky. So even in the solar system, we see a lot of diversity in terms of how magnetic fields behave and, and evolve. Uh, brown dwarfs also have magnetic fields. Um, 2001 was the first detection of that, uh, and there's been a lot of work. Uh, studying brown dwarf magnetic fields. So again, trying to bridge the gap between uh, planets and, and exoplanets. And so exoplanets, basically, for, for many decades, people have thought that we should they should have magnetic fields, we should be able to detect them, and people have been looking. Uh, I think the first time was 1970s, people started looking. And we're still looking today. Uh, so there's still not a very conclusive detection. So why even care? So again, as I said, a lot of people are studying atmospheres with JST, uh, planet formation, star formation, stuff like that. So why would we even care? So the first thing that we can learn is if we get a magnetic field measurement, we can actually learn about the interior structure of the, of the planets. So we've done, well, this is actually what we did with the solar system basically in 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, before we actually were able to send spacecraft to them. Um, and so basically if you have a magnetic field, it tells you that there is something in the interior, a magnetic dynamo that is causing that. For example, for Jupiter with metallic hydrogen, Jupiter's magnetic field was discovered in 1955 using radio observations. Uh, and then they were able to figure out that metal this, this new exotic uh, form of hydrogen was causing that. So it did uh, 
create some interesting physics as well in terms of understanding planets. And it will also break many of the general energies in the mass radius diagram. So if the only thing you have is a mass and a radius, there's a lot of things that can create that massing radius. And so this was one of the dimensions. Uh, again, atmospheric research could be another dimension uh, to break that. So this is, and how the, the interiors of planets form and evolve very much relates to how they, uh, how they actually formed in the first place. As well as atmospheric escape. So the paradigm for a very long time was that basically a magnetic field is gonna protect your atmosphere from being stripped away. So I show here a schematic from the MAVEN mission showing Mars's basically atmosphere being stripped away, where they actually can have real observations of basically the stellar wind stripping away the, the, magnetic, uh, the atmosphere of Mars in real time. Uh, so people have thought about this for a while, as well as there's some thoughts about the radius gap. So if you look at planet size versus the occurrence rate, uh, there are a lot of plant. There's not a lot of big planets, even though they're easy to study. There's a lot of these Neptune, sub-Neptune sized planets, super Earths, and there's a lot of Earths, and there's a gap in between the radius gap. And maybe one of the, the explanations is possibly uh, atmospheric loss controlled by the magnetic field. Not the only explanation, but maybe a lot, one of the explanations. So this was a paradigm for quite a long time. That paradigm is kind of shifting to being more complex and more complicated, as most science is. Uh, so there was a study looking at if you get a Mars-like planet, you put it you know, in Mars-like orbit, you change its magnetic field, uh, and then you see how ba basically the atmosphere escapes. And they noticed something very interesting, that basically there was, it actually, if there was no magnetic field, the escape was quite low. If there was a strong magnetic field, also the escape was quite low. But somewhere in the middle, there was actually a peak. So actually, having a magnetic field was actually causing the atmosphere to escape even more. So that's maybe unfortunate. Uh, and so it's an interplay basically between the in induced magnetic field of the stellar wind as well as the magnets for the planet and how, how those interact with each other. So when I saw this study, uh, and there's a lot of other people who are thinking about this, I came to think about as an observer that basically this motivates us to actually get magnetic field strengths for all types of planets uh, and to see if basically the magnetic field hurts or harms their atmosphere, right? Does it actually increase the escape or decrease the escape? Uh, so that's kind of how I think about it as an observer. So we still actually need to know the magnetic field, and this might actually motivate us for studying different types of planets. As well as atmospheric dynamics. So if you, be, and this is a simulation by Rogers, where you're seeing all these like magnetic field structures interacting uh, in the atmosphere, and that actually has an effect on the atmospheric dynamics in terms of the possibilities that you can have. And this also shows uh, an example here, where you have basically the th thermal structure of a tightly locked planet, uh, it looks quite normal, right? One side is hot, one side is cool. You introduce a magnetic field, and you can see just by eye, uh, that starts to change. The hotspot moves, the winds start moving uh, at different speeds and stuff like that. So there, is, there could be some dynamical effect on the exoplanet atmosphere if there's a magnetic field or not. Again, this is not the only thing that changes atmospheric dynamics, of course, and it's, it's probably one of the, the many things we have to take into account. And this is possibly being starting to be seen with JWST. Uh, so some people in this room actually worked on this data uh, from HJWST. This big WASP-18 planet, so ultra-hot Jupiter, orbits really close to its star, about 2,500 Kelvin, and it has a very large mass. It's almost a, it's almost a, a brown dwarf, not quite, about 10 masses of Jupiter, and they observed it in a mission, so when it went behind the star. And this was the, the nice spectrum that they got, and they were able to constrain some cool stuff in the atmosphere. And then they have this nice, basically, dynamic map where they're able to show the hot spot and the cool spot and stuff like that. And they noticed from the brightness map that there was a lack of east to, east to west winds that you would expect from normal uh, GCM models. And one of those possibilities is something is dragging on the atmosphere, which could be caused by a strong magnetic field. That's not the only explanation, but it's one of the explanations. So if we go get an external measurement of the magnetic field of this planet, we can put that into the model and see if that matches up or not. So, there might be some synergies between uh, atmospheric observations. As well as formation. So I always like this schematic way, uh, uh, from literature where it kind of shows like all the things that are going on during planet formation, which is super, super complex. And uh, the magnetic field of the planet could actually interact with the with basically the gas that's coming in. Uh, and there are some uh, people in literature that thinks actually the final spin of the planet actually controlled by the magnetic field. Uh, as well as there's been some uh, thoughts recently, this came out like a few months ago, where basically obic, obic dissipation can actually influence the formation uh, of super-Earths. Um, so there's some people that are starting to think about this 
in a, in a very serious manner. It's again, not the only thing. There are some people in this room who, who play study for, uh, plan of formation, but it might be one of the many, many knobs that we need to think about. So if we get magnetic field strengths of basically young planets, we can put that on our models and see how much it, it, it affects. Uh, as well as it's kind of a segue from the, the last point, oh, actually orbit dissipation itself on basically Jupiter-like planets. So one of the biggest problems in exoplanet research is why are all these hot Jupiters inflated? So I show here a, a plot of the influx of a bunch of hot Jupiters versus the planetary AI versus some theoretical models. And a lot of these planets are above what, we, what they should be. They're very inflated. This is the hot Jupiter inflation problem. And there are a lot of ways that people have tried solving this, and it seems to work. Some of them do, some of them don't. And one of the thoughts was basically, if the planet has a magnetic field, it actually could import uh, basically extra energy into the planet and, and puff it up. It's not the only thing probably that can solve this problem. It might be one of those things. But again, we actually need to know the magnetic field because a lot of these models just guess, right? It's, it's, we don't actually know what they are. So if we actually know what they are, we can put them in the models. Does it actually matter? Does it not? As well as exomoons. Everybody loves exomoons. Apparently, they're really popular in, in Hollywood. Um, and so, but there are some thoughts about how to detect exomoons, specifically from radio observations, uh, and maybe and how that interacts with the magnetic field of the planet, essentially. And then say you don't like planets, maybe you like stars. Uh, but if you get a big Jupiter-sized planet, people thought that this Jupiter-sized planet has a magnetic field. It actually is going to interact with the star magnetically and create star spots on your star that otherwise wouldn't be there, maybe flares, stuff like that. So if you care about stars, maybe the nearby planets are going to affect those. So that might be something. But again, we actually need to know the magnetic field structure to understand if that actually is happening or not. And then everyone's favorite, compatibility, right? This is always an open question. I like this the schematic for Meadows and Barnes that shows all the possible things that could play into a planet being habitable. So of course, there's the stellar effects, what the star is doing, its evolution, and that's how it evolves, where it, what it looks like now, what it looked like in the past, where it's in the galaxy, possibly. Uh, actually, the planetary system might also affect it. Right? Do you need a Jupiter? Do you not? Do you need moons? Or do you not, for example? And of course, everything with the planet itself, like the surface, the, the interior, the atmosphere, there's a lot, right? And the magnetic field might go into that wonderful equation, possibly. So one of the ways, besides the atmosphere stuff I was talking about with atmospheric escape, so if you want to sustain your atmosphere, do you need a magnetic field? Will it help you or harm you? Another way that people have been thinking about it is if you get a magnetic field measurement, you can learn about the interior structure that can inform you if this is a good candidate for habitability that you should put all your resources to the study. Uh, for example, if you have magnetic field measurement, you might be able to constrain the existence of plate tectonics, and plate tectonics may or may not be important for life. A lot of people think about that in literature. As well as you can constrain the size of cores with magnetic field measurements, uh, and if you have such a large core, you might not ever actually go to form a secondary atmosphere in the first place. So those are some, some of the ways that you can kind of go back and forth between habitability and the magnetic fields. As well as cosmic rays. So there's some thoughts in the literature that if you look at, so this is showing the energy of cosmic rays versus the particle flux. Uh, for the highest energies, it doesn't matter uh, because to just come through and hit the atmosphere and hit the surface. But if you basically have a magnetic field, you actually get orders of magnitude less cosmic rays uh, if you have basically weak or no magnetic fields. So this might be important for life as well. Um, there's, it doesn't go to zero, which is important because maybe you need at least a few cosmic rays to start life, but you don't want enough to basically bake it away. So that might also be important for shielding both the atmosphere as well as the surface. So I gave you lots of reasons that I think that people should care about magnetic fields, uh, but now how do we detect them? That's a great question. So there's been a lot of thoughts about in this in the literature. Uh, and this was a review paper from a while ago that went through all the possible thoughts that people were having. There's a few af after this that were added uh, that we can discuss offline. But they went through all of them and they said, should we see an effect? Is it are all our false positives? Are there false negatives? Is it suitable? And they came up with a conclusion that radio observations is one of the best methods to study exoplanet magnetism. So this doesn't mean you shouldn't use the other methods. It's just maybe you should combine them with uh, complementary techniques. Uh, and I've worked a lot on this starting when I was at U of A and went to UVA and then eventually when I was Cornell, but some of the false positives. So if you have questions about that offline, let me know. So I'll, I'm going to talk about radio observations for the rest of the talk today. So what have, actually are we observing? So let's see if this video uh, works. So basically, we're observing stellar wind particles 
interacting with the magnetic field of the planet. So those solar wind particles basically interact with the magnetic field line, gyrate, create, and gyrate around the magnetic field lines and create radio waves through the electron cycle to major emission mechanism. Uh, and this video was kind of showing how this, we see this on Earth, uh, basically, and that uh, the same electrons that create the radio emission actually come and create the aurora, the optical and UV aurora that we see. Um, so what is an like, electron cyclotron major emission and how can we use it to study magnetic fields? So, I, so all the solar system planets that have magnetic fields have been detected in the radio, uh, as well as uh, the Ganymede as well. And I show a plot here of some of the, the main ones, Jupiter, Saturn, Earth, Uranus, and Neptune, frequency versus flux, basically. And the, the thing from this plot you can learn is if you get a spectrum of the planet and you find its, mag its maximum frequency, you now know the magnetic field at the, the pole, basically, of the planet. So then you can constrain the magnetic field of the interior. Uh, and you're, we're using the, the gyro frequency equation, which is the frequency is 2.8 times the magnetic field strength. So it's very simple. If you get a, if you have a detection, you know what the, the magnetic field is. So that's the basically the frequency axis. The flux axis is basically what are the electrons doing, where they're coming from, and how they're interacting with the, the magnetosphere. So for Jupiter, you can see right away, there's actually three, three humps here. One is due to Io, one is due to stellar wind, and one is basically the Io plasma torus. So actually two are due to Io. So if we ever get a spectrum like this, and we see two or three humps, it's going to be due to a moon, right? That's, that's the only way we know how that's possible. Uh, and then if you just look at, like, basically Earth and Saturn, they're, they're kind of normal-ish shape, right? So they're just the stellar wind is the, the, the main driver of that. So the great thing about ECMI emission is 100% circularly polarized, and not a lot of things in the universe are circularly polarized. We're looking at very low frequencies. So this is basically going all the way to 10 megahertz from the ground and below. And kilohertz, so you know we're going pretty low frequencies here. Uh, and the flux from the planet is expected to be much greater than the flux from the star. And I'll go into that in a few slides. But if you put Jupiter and you put it on an exoplanet distance, one, two, five parsecs, we'll never detect it. We've known that basically since 1950s. We'll never be able to detect this, even with like SKA times 10, right? Um, which don't, it doesn't even observe these, these frequencies anyway. But we, so we need something to pump up that, which I will explain. And uh, that's basically where hot Jupiters come into play. And then one thing you'll notice here as well is really the only planet we can study from the ground is Jupiter-like planets. And then the rest of them uh, we can observe from space. So I will, that'll be at the end of my talk. So how do we want to study other planets besides Jupiter? As well as the mission is beamed, um, which is also fun. Uh, so for tidally locked planets, that means part of the orbit is going to be pointing towards us. The beam is part of the orbit then pointing away from us, like a lighthouse, essentially. So we have to observe pretty much the entire orbit of the planet, um, which makes it more difficult. And these are actually some real data from the from the solar system. So this is actually from the ground from Jupiter, uh, and this is actually Saturn from from space from Cassini. And then you can see a lot of structure in these this, this data. Uh, but again, the structure tells you basically what, what the, how the electrons are interacting with the magnetosphere for the planet. People spend entire theses studying this. It's a lot of, it's very interesting. But the idea is that you can basically, if you look at dif different frequencies, will emit at different parts of the magnetosphere. Uh, and so depending on the structures that you see, there's like an arc here. Maybe you're observing a magnetic line on the side. If there's a bunch of just like random stuff, maybe you're observing a magnetic field straight on. So you can play this game a lot in the solar system. Maybe one day we can do some exoplanets. But this is not an old idea. So I think the first in the literature that's actually been published is 1977. Um, people thinking about you can detect exoplanets. So the title of it was a search for extrasolar Jovian planets by radio techniques. So people have been thinking about this for a long time. It's a very old idea. And then when I visited JPL a few months ago, they, they, there was this internal memo that was never published. We're trying to put it on the archive eventually, but it's only in a PDF, and apparently the archive doesn't like PDFs. Uh, and from 1974, where also people were thinking about how can you detect exoplanet magnetic fields with the radio. So it's a very old idea. Uh, and the thing that's going to help us for exoplanets is this correlation that people found pretty early on in the solar system. So I show both an example of Earth as well as uh, Saturn. So on Earth, if you look at the uh, solar wind speed versus basically the, the radio flux, if you increase the solar wind speed by a factor of two, you actually get an order of magnitude greater in the solar wind flux. And this actually was in situ measurements with satellites above Earth, which was quite cool. Um, and that was in 1967. And then the same, they, they found the same thing. If you increase the pressure uh, on, on Saturn, stellar wind pressure, you also get a, a rise in the, the radio flux. 
So essentially, the stellar wind density, higher it is, the higher the radio flux. And so people actually put this together in what's called the magnetic boat's law. And they like did a correlation. So you've got the incident magnetic power or incident kinetic power of the stellar wind uh, versus the radio power. And of course, there's a power law that all the solar system planets form along very nicely, as well as the moons. And then this was actually used to predict what the radio fluxes were from Uranus and Neptune before the Voyager missions went there. So it was, that was quite cool. But then if you extrapolate that to hot Jupiters, you can get something like 10 to the 3, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 even times greater flux uh, from a hot Jupiter system than you would from the solar system. And now you might be able to detect this at an exoplanet distance. So now we have the frequency, or we have the flux about the frequency. This is where the fun comes into play as I'm an observer. And so there was a review article in, two, in 2010, and there's been a few that had it since then, but it's the same idea as the, the same problem is still here. That there's a lot of magnetic uh, scaling laws in the literature that explain all of the solar system planets and equally bad or equally good, if whatever you think about that. Uh, and we don't, they're really unconstrained essentially, because you have a handful of planets. We think about gas giants here four. Uh, and a lot of parameters that could go into that. And so the way I think about that as an observer, so now if we get five, ten, hundreds, thousands of exoplanets, we can like, eventually go back and figure out which one of these scaling laws are correct. Um, I, already there's some, it, brown dwarfs seem to be a deviation from this, so there's already some indications that some of these scaling laws from the solar system might not apply to brown dwarfs, but it's, I, I don't know if that's supposed to be the case. But if you look at the one of the most popular ones, if you look at the heat flux of the interior of the planet versus the magnetic field strength, there seems to be a correlation. You have Earth and Jupiter here. Um, and then you have a nice correlation. You extrapolate it to hot Jupiters. OK, it's going to be comparable to Jupiter even greater. So we can go test that. We can actually go see if that's true or not. Looks like stars fit along that line a little bit as well, possibly. So we need more observations. <laughs> that's the way I think about it. Uh, so let's let's do that. So the first thing is like, what targets should we look at for, to start with? So if you put those two mag the scaling laws for the frequency, the one I talked about for the magnetic fields, as well as the flux density from the magnetic Boat's law, you get a plot like this. Uh, and all the little triangles are all the exoplanets known at the time. Um, and then we show some sensitive curves from, from known telescopes. So we have LOFAR here, which is the main one we talk about, SKA, year two, two, et cetera. And so if a planet goes above that curve, Maybe we should go look at it, see, test these scaling laws, see if they're true, see if they're not. So if we get a statistical sample, then we'll hopefully know if something's going on. Uh, so let's do it. So let's try to do that. And people have tried for a long time. Uh, so people started looking in 1977 uh, for exoplanet radio mission before exoplanets were known. And they've used almost every radio telescope since then, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and I, I do this because I like to show that I'm not the first person who tried to doing this. There's a lot of legacy that I'm building off of standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, but the problem was a lot of a lot of these people just pointed randomly, because again, you didn't know exoplanets existed, or once you did, you, you pointed at them anyway. Uh, but a lot of these frequencies are way too high for any of the predictions uh, that were made in the literature, but it's useful to look anyway, uh, as well as the sensitivities were way too low to detect something at an exoplanet distance. Uh, so it was useful to look to see if we found anything very unexpected. We have not. Uh, and then now, basically, in the regime of low frequencies, uh, many of and low far, which I'm going to talk about today, we're now in a regime where, as I just showed you, where we should expect to see something if these scaling laws are correct. So that's what we did. So I'm going to talk about mostly about Chao Bu today, because um, it's the most interesting target and the one that we have the most interesting data on so far. So Chao Bu B is this big Jupiter planet. Uh, discovered in 1997 uh, through RV measurements, uh, but it actually has atmospheric high resolution observations, so we can actually constrain its inclination. So we actually have a, a pretty good constraint on its mass. It's 5.8 Jupiter masses, 3.3 uh, day orbit, typical hot Jupiter, 700 degrees Kelvin. Uh, but if you put this on the, the, the predictions, it's the highest one, right? It's the best one. We should go look at it. So let's do that. So we apply for time on LOFAR. We ask for a lot of hours. Uh, so let's see if we get them. Right. So low far. So again, for people who are not used to uh, low frequency telescopes, uh, this is low far here. So you can see low, we're using low band antennas, which are all here. They're basically dipoles, right? They're very thin dipoles. I started as an optical astronomer going observing on, on basically Mount Lemmon. 
So this is a very exotic telescope or even radio telescopes on, on Kip Peak. Uh, this, look, this is not a dish. Uh, and then this shows the, the core of LOFAR in which we use. We didn't use the external uh, stations here. And all these little dots you see here are actually those low band stations. So there's actually a lot of them across this many kilometer area. And it's on an island. And the reason we put on, they put it on an island is because the sheep kept on breaking the telescope. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we don't, we don't want that to happen. So let's, <laughs> let's, use, the, let's use this telescope um, and see what we're doing. So the observational setup, both for LOFAR and NFAR, is kind of the same. So we're basically using beamform observations. So we have a, a, a beam uh, on the target, like you could think about it like a pixel on the target. And then we have two simultaneous pixels beams on the off sky. So there's nothing in there except for sky. So we use those off beams to basically calibrate our on beam. So think the Earth's ionosphere, instrumental systematics, our radio frequency interference, humans, all these things we want to get rid of. And so we use the off beams to calibrate the on beam. So if something is in the on beam that isn't in the off beam, we, we, we think it might be real, right? It's something to, to follow up, something to, to think about. And then we cross validate. We actually look at off versus off, off versus on, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and we're lo really low frequency, 16 to 73, almost as far as you can go from the ground. We have all polarizations, specifically in talk about Stokes V. We have really good time and frequency resolution, not because we need that for exoplanets. We're actually gonna have to like, go over like 10, 20 minutes, 10, 20, uh, uh, megahertz bandwidth to actually see exoplanets, but this is really good to get rid of the humans. The humans get in our way all the time. We have a lot of frequency inter radio frequency interference from humans. Uh, we get really good sensitivity, so we're going to use this, this telescope. So we asked for hundreds and hundreds of hours of low power, and they were like, no, we're only going to give you 20 hours. And I was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to deal with that. So as I said, basically we want to observe in the entire orbit uh, because before recently, we didn't know what part of the orbit we should look at. So we, some part of the orbit should be pointing towards us, some part of it, the beam. So we have the orbital phase here versus just uh, spread out in days, essentially. Uh, and we tried observing as much part of the orbit as possible. Of course, we couldn't get the whole thing because they didn't give us the time to do that. Uh, but we tried to spread it out just to kind of um, see if we would get, get lucky. And I'm pointing to these two because uh, I'll talk about those in a few minutes. So we got about 25% of the orbit of Tau Vu. And then I want to talk about the, the pipeline that I created called Borealis. Aurora Borealis. Get it? The backronym, of course, for Beam Form Radio Emission Analysis Pipeline. Uh, and it's what was basically the meat of my PhD uh, when I was uh, living in France. So I show some of the, the raw data here from LOFAR. Uh, it's a dynamic spectrum, so time versus frequency. And as you can see right away, there's a lot of structure there. So if we look at it in a different way, if we look at a time series, basically integrate all our frequencies or a frequency response, integrate all time, you kind of see things pop out right away from the raw data. You can see these nice spikes everywhere. These are radio frequency interference. These are humans. It's the bane of my existence. Uh, these are, in this plot, it looks like they're periodic, which they were. This is not always the case. It's usually not always the case that they're periodic. You don't really can't predict when they happen. And you can't predict the frequency or the time or anything, so it's always varying. It's great, uh, but they're all. And, and you can see there are certain frequencies, such as radio stations or, or etc. Or, or other things, you know, things on the highway that are communicating or whatever, that are always bad. So we have got to remove those. As well as the response of the telescope, we got to correct for that, which changes with beam and time and and frequency as well. Um, so you know, I always like to say my PhD in one slide. Uh, and then, so this is basically going through the, running through the pipelines. This is now some normalized data. Looks almost like random noise, which it should, but we're getting pretty close. So if you look at the frequency response, it is flat, which is nice. If you look at the time series, it's almost like random noise, but there's actually a signal on there due to the ionosphere of Earth varying a little bit. So that's actually what we expect. So we're, we're doing quite well. So the way we're going to search is actually we, we validate this using Jupiter observations. So this is actually a real observation from Jupiter using LOFAR. As you can see, the structure is quite complex. Maybe we'll never actually get this kind of structure from exoplanets, but we want to we want to use this to validate our pipeline and figure out how we're going to search for a signal. So we took this observation and we scaled it as an exoplanet. So we took it and we scaled it like by a billion times, put it at an exoplanet distance, one, two, three, four, five, ten parsecs, and then saw how can we detect it and using our pipeline that we created. So we know the ground truth. Let's see if we can get it out of the pipeline. And so I guess the, the easiest one intuitively to think about is we look for slow emission, which is pretty simple. We integrate over all time or all, all frequency uh, for the beams. So this is showing the time series for the Jupiter beam versus the off beam. 
And just right away, you're like, oh, there's something there. You subtract them and you actually see that there are definitely places that you see emission. And if we go back to the real observation, those are actually the brightest parts of the emission from Jupiter. So we're on the right track. And you kind of, you can put this at different parts of the spectrum. You put this from 54 to 56. Okay, you can detect it out. So we're, we're on the right track. And then we also know that Jupiter has really bright bursts. So basically Jupiter's radio emissions go by an order of magnitude for like a few seconds and then go away back to a normal level and then wait for 10 minutes and it happens again. Uh, and so we want to look for that as well. So we took the dynamic spectrum, we high pass filtered it, got rid of any uh, any signal longer than a few minutes, and then look for spikes basically. And we we uh, normalized by the standard deviation just to make it easier to, to compare against the off beam. And so right away I show here a time series of Jupiter versus the off beam. Oh, you can see the spikes of Jupiter quite well there. Uh, but that's probably never going to be the case for exoplanets because again, a lot of this is within our noise. So we wanted to think about a different uh, parameter space to look at this. So if we just put all the data in one parameter space, basically the on beam versus off beam in sigma space. Uh, so and you compare them, and it's basically on, along anything along the diagonal should that is left over is correlated between the two beams. Um, so that would be ionospheric effects, for example, um, or leftover R five, which we don't think is there, but in case it is, that should be there. And then we look for something, for example, in the off beam or the on beam that otherwise is not in the off beam. So we kind of compare all these triangles to this one and kind of move it around. And then we can create a statistic that looks like this um, that we can compare against random uh, Gaussian noise, one, two, three, sigma. And we notice, oh, it def definitely is not that, right? It def there's definitely something there. Jupiter is very much uh, a many. So that's kind of what we're trying to look for. So we looked through all the data for Taubu as well as a few other targets uh, that we can talk about offline. Uh, and for the most part, they're all non-detections. I looked through like 30,000 plots by eye, it was great. Uh, but all the time series, our, our experiment did work though. So every time we looked at an off beam and we compared it to another off beam, they were exactly the same within thermal noise. So we're like, okay, our experiment's working. That's really good. So I showed an example here of a time series versus on versus off. You can see there's a lot of structure. This is due to the ionosphere as well as instrumental systematics that are left over, but they're the same between all the three beams and just random noise. And then you can look at the integrated frequency between the off beams, and you see there's a lot of structure there. Uh, you can actually see like a nice pattern, a sinusoidal pattern, you see that? So that actually is imperfect phasing from the from the low far array, which they didn't know was happening until we took these observations, uh, which was fun for, for us to find this out. Uh, but again, we have all these 256 dishes that you're supposed to combine together coherently, and some of them were not. Uh, but they were the same, thankfully, between the off beams, so you just get random noise. Uh, um, so we told Lofar about this, they fixed it, but obviously the observations we took were, were still there. But with one exception. So we did find some tentative signals from, from Tau Bu B. Uh, and I'll start with the slow emission one. So we again look at the integrated frequency, and you can see by eye right away that basically the on beam is super different from the off beams, right? So you just subtract the on beam from any off beam, you get the same signal, the off beams are just random noise. Uh, so we get a signal from about 20 to 30 megahertz. Um, we were quite excited about this. It's like actually what we're looking for. And it was about an 8.6 sigma detection. So we're like, this is a really good signal. This is something we should follow up. And then we also saw some bursty emission too. So we compared basically the burst statistic that we got from on versus off beam versus the off beam. So off beam just is like random noise. Uh, and there was some slight excess signal in the bursty emission as well, about a 3.2 sigma detection. So it's kind of on the edge, whether it's real or not. Uh, but either way, we needed to confirm this. And these were at different parts of the orbit, as well as they had different uh, signs in that uh, circular polarized. So one was plus and circularly uh, neg plus and negatively circular polarized. So we were quite excited about this, and we published this a few years ago. And we we're like, this is could possibly be one of the first detections of an exoplanet on the radio. So what can we do with it? So this is actually the this is, was actually surprising. So we went, went back and looked at the dynamic spectrum itself. And we subtracted the on versus the off here, and then we just subtracted the off by the off there. So this should be more or less random noise, and this should have a signal in it, and it did. So this actually was quite unexpected, because we didn't actually think you should be able to see this in the raw dynamic spectrum. But you can, you can kind of see the, the, the signal there, which is quite exciting. So this is a real detection that can actually use this as far as actually doing real physics with the magnetosphere of, of Tau Bu and how that interacts with, uh, with basically the planet. Um, so we're not eventually going to do that if it's real, but not right now. So then we compared this detection to uh, the literature. Uh, so this again, showing the 
prediction plot, frequency versus flux density. Uh, and these are some of the prediction uh, curves here. And this is our detection here, basically. And it, it more or less uh, uh, is consistent with some of the theoretical prediction uh, from Gressmeyer et al. Uh, so that was really uh, exciting. So we can actually get a, a constraint on the magnetic field uh, basically between 5.5 and 11 Gauss. So 11 Gauss would be the, the pole of the planet, which is comparable to Jupiter. It's about 0.94, the magnetic moment of Jupiter. So that was quite exciting. And then last year, um, some folks from uh, a, uh, from John Hopkins, uh, APL, uh, were, were starting to create a model, put, inputting all the known uh, orbital dynamics that we know about Taubo and other planets, and to see if we can have a, a pseudo prediction for what part of the phase we should look at. Because looking at the entire orbital phase of these hot Jupiters takes a lot of time. Uh, and so they came up with this model, they, they created it, and then they sent me an email and they're like, can we compare this to your observations? Uh, and I was like, sure. So they sent me the, the, the plot that looks like this, which is basically orbital phase of the planet, uh, versus latitude of, of emission, essentially. So the blue line is actually where the magnetic pole is emitting, uh, if you can think about it that way. Uh, and the magnetic oval is where you would also see the optical and near aurora as well. Uh, and then the green line is where Earth intersects that. So wherever there's an intersection, you should be able to see the radio emission. That's the idea. And so I will plot of this, and we actually were quite... Confidence. So the slow emission was here where there's an overlap in the southern hemisphere, and the burst emission was here where there was an overlap in the northern hemisphere. And so we were quite excited by that. So maybe we're on the right track. Maybe this is something we can use for other planets as well. We don't have to observe the entire orbit, just parts of the orbit. Uh, but we want to make sure this is real. So we have, again, we have one observation uh, at different phases. Uh, we wanted to try to observe those same phases again, as well as with multiple telescopes, because we were somewhat concerned about some instrumental semantics that didn't kind of uh, fall out of the data. Uh, so it was, so there was something that we did worry about. So we did a follow-up campaign in 2020. As most people know, 2020 was a mm -hmm. complex year. Uh, so we tried. Uh, so we basically took observations from LOFAR. We tried taking new observations in NFR, which I'll explain in the next slide. It's a new telescope that we're commissioning in, in, in France. Uh, this was very early in the commissioning. We used a uh, telescope, UTAR-2 in Ukraine, uh, LW in New Mexico as well. And so we tried observing all these near simultaneous observations, and we had a lot of problems. So basically, LWA ran out of memory in their, all their disks because no one was on site to, to notice that because it was dynamic. So we lost all our data. Uh, for Nanofar, we lost like almost half the data because, again, no one was on site. Uh, something went wrong with the machine because it's an early, fa early phase of the telescope. Something also went wrong. So that was that. Some of the data we were able to re recover, uh, which was nice. But uh, we didn't know we had that until more recently. And then UTR2 did take all, all the observations. So UTR2 doesn't have polarization, but it's just as sensitive as LOFAR. So we thought it would be useful to do that. So we put the data on the archive in, UTR in Ukraine. And we're like, we'll download this data when we want to use it. You might see where this is going. That data, that building, which is as big as Stewart's, six floors of radio astronomers studying everything for 50 years, is completely demolished. They bombed the hell out of it. Uh, we think that the Russians also dismantled the telescope. This telescope was, I think, built almost 50 years ago or more. It's been studying lots of different things in the universe. Uh, and our colleagues, we think, uh, were recruited for the war. I haven't, we haven't heard from them since the war started. So that was kind of like a weird intersection of my research with this this uh, this political action that's happening, uh, the invasion of Russia. Uh, just I never thought I would have to write in an application. I can't get this data because of an ongoing invasion. So that was weird. So I, I digress from that. But um, so actually, look, let's look at some data that we do have. So as I mentioned, uh, this is actually a real picture of, of Nanofar in France. Just a lot of these little dipoles, basically across the many kilometer area. There's about 96 of them. Um, and it's currently undergoing commissioning we're from 10 to 85 megahertz. Uh, and anybody who's worked on a new instrument will probably tell you any problem that you can have, you will have. And we've been experiencing all of those, um, which has been quite a, an adventure to say the least. Uh, but in the, in the end, it should be more sensitive than LOFAR because we're taking the lessons we learned from LOFAR and trying to improve. So it should be about five to maybe 10 times more sensitive than LOFAR. With pulsar observations, we've actually been able to prove that. Maybe with other observations, we still have to see if that, that holds the case as well. So this is the campaign that we did with LOFAR and NFR, uh, where these are, I was showing the orbital phases before. This is where the slow emission happened. So the first emission happened. 
Uh, and we reobserved basically in 2020, where we got two low far observations with a slow emission and one burst um, up there as well. Um, we got a 94 as well. So that was that was useful. So we actually got two telescopes. And, everything. and this is actually some of the new far data, which is I would like to show because it's like very, very complicated data to work with. Uh, so this is, as you can see, like there's lots of structures here. There's uh, the background is changing, all, all these wonderful things. But we think we can deal with that so we can actually get rid of most of that and actually start to look for these, these smaller signals, um, these bursty signals. However, we don't see anything. So this is showing the frequency uh, plot again, frequency versus flux of all the different beams. You can see there's a lot of structure. You can see right away there isn't that nice sinusoidal structure. So they actually solved the problem of low far. So this is low far data. So they actually solved that problem, but we still have some, some low level noise, but it's the same between all the beams. So that was, that was nice again. So we're, our experiment's still working, but we don't see an 8.6 signal detection. That's quite sad. Uh, and the same thing for the burst emission. So one observation, we see something, one observation we don't. What's going on? So the saddest part could be this the original detection could have been an instrumental systematic that we just don't understand. I had like a 20 or 30 page appendix on my first paper where we tried going through every single one that we could think of and we couldn't, we banged everything that we could think of basically. But this is still a possibility, unfortunately. So, but we think the new observations from LOFAR gives us a new clue. So I show here the off beam from the old observation of the slow emission versus the off beams of the uh, new observations and they seem consistent. So it doesn't seem like the off beams and the old observations were very different than the new, one, the new ones. That doesn't mean that this was not a problem, but it just means that at least it's an extra clue. But I think the more interesting pro problem is actually astrophysical. So yeah, I, might, I mentioned at the beginning that if you change the stellar wind density, you're going to change the, the flux of the planet uh, that you see. Um, perhaps the emission cone is related to the moon of the planet. I haven't thought about that. That's a great question. That could also be a possibility. Thank you, James. Uh, if you want to chat about that online, let me know. I, I haven't really thought about that. That's interesting. Uh, so maybe it's a moon, but let's think about something that we can actually constrain, possibly, uh, with current, current with current observations. So there was a study uh, in 2015 where they actually took basically magnetic maps of Tau Bu, the star, and extrapolated what uh, the radio flux of Tau Bu, the, the B, the planet, would look like. And they noticed a very interesting correlation that different parts of the magnetic cycle produce obviously different part, different emission. So sometimes it went almost to zero, sometimes it's order magnitude greater than that, depending on the part of the cycle you were in. And Tau Bu, the star, has a very well-defined uh, magnetic cycle of about 120 days, which is quite quick compared to our sun. So it's very, people love this star, they study it a lot. So that's what we're trying to do now. So we're trying to basically prove this hypothesis that we should see some kind of on and off behavior. So if we look at stellar maximum of Tau Bu, if we look at stellar minimum, we should see something that's off, we should see something that's on. That's the theory. So let's do that. So we did it, we've done been doing a big follow-up campaign with NFR, and we're gonna continue this next year with NFR and low far observations uh, simultaneous again. Uh because I love simultaneous observations because it makes more sense to, to me. Okay, thank you mm -hmm. for the, uh, that little link there. Um so we're doing a big follow-up campaign. We're trying to follow the over two times the magnetic cycle as well as we're getting simultaneous or near simultaneous maps of the, the star itself uh, every few months. So we can actually know what part of the cycle the star is uh, while we're observing on the radio. And so this is showing basically the orbital phases that we're observing, the number of times we've observed them. Uh, so again, 0.65 and 0.8, we're observing a lot. And then we just observe other phases just to kind of fill in the parameter space to make sure we're not biasing ourselves as much as possible. Um, so we've been doing that and we think we might have actually had a redetection. So this is, as I like to say, fresh off the computer. Um, before I started traveling, as Megan knows for like the past month, uh, this is basically what I did in France about a month ago. We ran uh, the many of our data through the pipeline and there's all these new problems that we we're dealing with that we didn't know with Volvar, but uh, a little bit grass on that. And so we, we looked basically at the on versus off beam and we see this blooming signal compared to the two off beams that more or less look like random noise. Uh, with some a high high tell there, but this is very preliminary. There's still a lot of things we need to check, uh, but we're very excited that maybe we're on the right track. Um, so, and then we're going to try to reobserve this again, as I said, in the upcoming year with NUFAR and LOFAR. So, hopefully, we'll have two telescopes that show the same awesome signal. 
So that's, that's what's going on right now. So I would like to briefly talk about the future. Uh, I have a few minutes to do that. Uh, the near future and the far future. And so in the near future, we're trying to do basically a large campaign with any far, looking at basically dozens of exoplanets um, over the entire orbit. So you can show the sensitivity curves here. So there's actually now a lot of planets that otherwise was not sensitive to low far. So we're going to be doing that uh, over the next five years, as well as low, low far 2.0 is coming also maybe five years from now. SK low, I'm not sure when that's ever coming, but maybe that'll come down sometime. <laughs> Uh, and so those will also be very interesting in the near future. But then I want to go to the moon or space. Both are good. So let's go. So in the near future, we are going. So I'm part of a mission called Ro Roseless that's actually launching in the next few months. I think the next launch uh, window is in November. So actually, it could be next month. And it's actually just one dipole. Um, this is a, a NASA schematic here. Uh, that's going to basically launch to the near side of the moon. Um, it's mostly used for lunar science and cosmology, uh, but I got on on it, interested in it because eventually we want to build more than one dipole on the moon. We want to do more more science, and so I'm going to be basically observing Earth and Jupiter as an exoplanet, simulate as simulate them or observe Jupiter and Earth, and simulate them as if they're exoplanets, and then see do we need ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions of dipoles? Can we actually do this with the way that people think we can? And then Lucy Knight, another dipole, is going to go to the far side of the moon. Um, basically in about two years from now. Um, and uh, we're gonna do the same same thing with Jupiter on that. And we're gonna hopefully compare them and we'll have a direct constraint on the, the radio frequency environments, which we know the far side's going way better, but we'll actually have a, a real number on that and how that will affect our observations. And then the future interesting uh, lunar observations that are probably gonna happen, maybe, is there, I'm on this mission called the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope, which is basically wanna put a giant telescope on a crater on the moon. And it's going to be like many kilometers wide. It's like an Arecibo on the moon, right? It's really cool. Uh, I think it's really cool. And uh, but it's not going to move, right? So it's just going to look up because they want to do it for cosmology. So they don't care about stars and galaxies and stuff uh, and exoplanets. But I do. And so there's about a thousand or two thousand craters we can choose on the moon. And so one of my jobs is basically going to choose that choose one of those craters that actually has exoplanets that pass over. Uh, that we can study, and we can basically study Jupiter and Earth-like planets. So if I find some Jupiters and Earths in the same field of view, that would be great. We'll, we'll see what happens. So, so that's that's something that may happen in the future, as well as this really cool uh, lunar array called Farside. It's going to be on the far side of the moon, where it's going to be this nice little, basically, um, flower-shaped. Uh, there's going to be thousands of dipoles they're predicting. And it's like a nice flower shape on the far side of the moon. And they made some predictions. So this is distance from Earth uh, with basically with the flux and the radio. Um, and they show that you can possibly detect, you know, tens to 20 uh, nearby exoplanets all the way from hot Jupiters to possibly the nearest uh, basically habitable zone planets, which would be quite cool. So can very much, we think will very much complement the JWST era. That's and this might happen in 10, 10, 10 15 years, depending on the funding. As well as uh, there's some ideas for CubeSats as well. Um, but this is like a billion dollar mission. Maybe the CubeSats can be way cheaper than that. Um, so there's been some thoughts that maybe you can have like thousands of CubeSats that orbit around the moon or the or Earth or the sun or wherever you want to put them. And basically they can detect exoplanets. Um, and so I've been in some communication with some people doing the GOLO a survey from, from MIT. They got a NASA NIAC um, proposal to do this. Uh, and it can hopefully study near, nearby exoplanets. So that maybe that will be another cheaper option to, to do this kind of science. So we'll stay, stay tuned for that. Uh, also, I'd just like to mention, I'm going to be here today and tomorrow. I work on a bunch of other things. I use a bunch of other techniques to study exoplanet magnet fields. So if you want to talk about that, you can. I do have exoplanet atmospheres with some people in this room. Um, uh, basically, all the way since I was an undergrad here, I've been doing ground-based stuff from uh, ground-based transit observations. I've been doing high-resolution observations. JWST, I look for orbital decay of exoplanets with tests. I've discovered a new planet by accident. I can tell you about that. Uh, and I also study some stuff in the solar system, uh, basically the plasma ion torus of Jupiter, uh, Titans, lakes, uh, and surface, which I actually did here at LPL, and then some ground-based uh, occultations for New Horizons and Lucy. So if anybody wants to talk about that, uh, let me know. So thank you for, for your time, and this is my summary. Great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience here or online? Um, yeah, 
Great talk, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if there's been any effort made to use some of the other um, wound detection methods uh, you mentioned to sort of supplement the, the low far um, and then far observations. Yeah, so I, for half of my, uh, so for like two years in U of A, and for half my thesis at UVA, which always confuses me, uh, I've been doing, I tried doing bow shocks, and some people are on those papers in the back here. I tried doing bow shocks and showed basically observationally and theoretically that was not possible. Uh, I've also recently been doing spectropolymetry in the helium line, uh, taking observations with Spiru. Um, and I asked for, and this, I got these observations in the, the pandemic as well. They were supposed to give me 10 transits and I've gotten like three or four. So it's, uh, so the data looks interesting, but we don't, we don't have enough data to say anything. Um, as well as I've been thinking about possible transits in the radio, for example, as well, and um, some, some other thoughts. And star planner actions, which I'm gonna try to apply for some, like looking at basically the calcium H&K line, uh, some of these nearby, uh, hot Jupiter uh, systems, which uh, people looked at 20 years ago and saw that there might have been some correlations, but there's been some recent work that showed those are basically might be false positives if you use modern modern statistics. Um, so I want to go back and like hammer those for, for hundreds of hours um, as well. And I have a few proposals on that. So there's a few other up, up, up things. Up there. And I want to talk to Megan about possibly using LBT as well to spectral polymetry. So, Hopefully, I have an idea that might work or might not. Yeah, there's definitely some other thoughts. There's a question online by uh, Vladimir. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Um, yes. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, yeah, that's the uh, my my question is about the binary system. So Tau Vu is a binary system, right? So it has yeah. N two, and that basically goes around with at a very eccentric uh, orbit. So it comes like around one arc second from the star all the way to a few arc seconds. So first question that how well you can res uh, resolve to to targets, and the second there was a contribution of M two, you know. So it might be the the good idea will be to add X-ray observations to better disentangle the um, activity of one of those or two stars, we don't know, right, uh, from the um, radio emission of, of the planet. Uh, yeah, I agree. I definitely want X-ray observations, but uh, there have been X-ray observations of Tau Bu for several years, and they've never detected any uh, flares from the ta either Tau Bu, from either star. Uh, there's, so there's never been any flares from either star detected at UV, at optical, or in X-rays. We don't think that's technically a, a problem, but again, that's why we're trying to reobserve at the same phases uh, of the planet that has absolutely nothing to do with, with the, the binary that's far away. So the, I, I agree that that is definitely a problem. We did talk about that in our paper, in our 21, 21 paper, that there is a degeneracy there that we can't, right, with, a, with only one orbital phase, we can't conclusively rule out the other star. But yeah, I definitely want X-ray observations at the same time, if possible. But we haven't got that schedule, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah, I also had a question. Um, what causes the like the full one hundred percent circular polarized signal compared to? Because uh, I mean, as you said, it's that's just the that's just, I mean that's the phys that's how the physics works. Yeah, physics. So that's basically every time we see CMI polarization in the solar system, it's 100% yeah. polarized. Um, so that's just the, the actual physical mechanism that's creating the emission. We're assuming it's going to be creating the emission we see. And then we can go back and then look at our observations. Uh, so when we looked at the LOFAR observations, we didn't put this in the paper because it's not actually calibrated yet for LOFAR, uh, but it did seem like it was 100% circular polarized. Uh, but the calibration on LOFAR, it was it, it was kind of uh, difficult. So we couldn't say that conclusively, so we didn't look at that in the paper. But it did seem like that was the case. Um, so we didn't see anything else in the observations. So yeah, that's definitely something that we're very interested in and also confirming. Because if we see something and it's not that, then it might actually be a, a something else in the system. Hello, yes. Um. So obviously in examining the, the sort of the periodicity of the star, the stellar, stellar wind, um, you are taking periodicity into account. Is there anything about the planet itself that should also affect the strength of your signal periodically over time or would that just be in such a 
you know, so much danger that you would think that too. Um, I mean, you're, are you saying like the magnetic field might change the planet? Oh, yeah, yeah, or I mean, obviously, burst emission is is some time variability in the planet itself. But is there anything sort of longer term generated by the planet itself that would cause your system to vary? Uh, so we do expect there should be like a ro rotation modulation from from the planet itself, um, but that's that's just basically a, a variation along that. So over a long term scales, yeah, we do expect the magnetic field uh, to decay, but that's over billions of years. So obviously, um, for a few hours of observations, we won't see that. So most of the variability is basically going to be how is the stellar wind interaction with the magnetosphere, and then if there's a a moon, which someone gave me a paper I have to look at, and that could be even a, a more complex interaction, obviously, from what we found from Jupiter. People are still studying this now. We still don't even understand how all the, the Jupiter's volcanoes interact with the magnetosphere and actually create the radio emission. That's actually still a very open question. Uh, so yeah, this it's so I think uh, all the complexity will be basically how do you take the stellar wind and convert it into the magnetosphere um, and can we have any constraints on that at all once we start getting observations that we we trust? That's going to be where the I think the main variability. Is. Okay. Um, yeah, we're at one o'clock, so I guess uh, we can wrap up. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you uh, for giving the talk, and thank everybody for attending. And we will see you again next week at our next Origin seminar. Copy these links that someone.